Kira, everyone, welcome. Welcome to this AES lunchtime seminar of Conversations Over the Ditch with um, Dr. Jess Dad. I'm Marini Sanka, the co convener of AES Aotearoa New Zealand. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands which we come from. I'm speaking from Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I acknowledge our leaders past, present and emerging. This seminar is recorded. Please feel free to introduce yourself um, in the chat section and type in any questions you may have throughout the presentation. Our presenter is Dr. Jess Dart, an AES Fellow and founding CEO of Clear Horizon Consulting. She is a recipient of the 2018 Award for Outstanding Contribution to Evaluation. Her specialities include evaluating large, complex and emerging programs, human-centered design, developmental evaluation, facilitating organizational effectiveness and theory of change. Her doctoral research involved adapting and testing a story-based participatory monitoring tool, the most significant change techniques which I have used in so many evaluations. Yes. So welcome, Jess, and thank you, and over to you. Hello, and thank you, Maria, and welcome, everybody. I'm coming to you today from the land of the Ganai Kurnai people. Actually, my um, I've just moved, so my tag's wrong. But uh, this is uh, Gippsland in uh, Victoria, and I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm standing today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and also acknowledge any First Nations people who might be on the call today. So it's really lovely to be here with you all. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you mostly about a case study today. And as I said, conversations over the ditch and the ditch, if you're not from New Zealand and Australia, we're talking about the, uh, the body of water between Australia and New Zealand. And uh, it was mostly to have a conversation about um, how evaluators are increasingly working in the front end of uh, program uh, of initiative design or, or uh, human centered design or co design and how evaluators are playing a role there and have a chat with you about that. But before I dive into the presentation, I'd love to find just a little bit out about who we have here today. So I'm wondering if we can have a little bit of a go at the chat function and do something called a chat slam. I don't know if you've ever done a chat slam before, but the idea is you type, but you don't press send until I tell you, and then we can all see everybody's comments. Well, I guess the first thing I'd just love to know is about you know what um what sector you work in so for me i am a bit of a cross-sector person i guess um so i'm a consultant and so i work across sectors sort of social impact social justice a little bit of international development so that's my sectors but i'd love to know what sector or how you describe the space that you work in whatever feels natural to you so if you don't mind starting to type and I'll press you, I'll, I'll ask you to press send at the same time, and then we can see who we've got here. So the, sec, the, the, um, the, the spaces that you work, however you like to define that. Let's give you a second. All right, press send, let's see who we've got. Uh, okay, let's see. So we have um, uh, health, uh, education, 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 government, evaluation, legal space, gender auditing Ooh. um social social housing and urban local government university mental health 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 lots of health lots of health social housing morning everybody to you too aboriginal health fantastic so we've got um i would say the social sector is dominating today maybe that'd be about right second question um so in my career i started off although i've been doing evaluation since gosh it's been about 30 years i'm showing my age hey um but before that my really early career was actually in participatory planning so i had a sort of bit of a background of uh does that what would you call co-design today i guess only it was framed differently then particularly um and i'd love to know whether you see yourself more of as an evaluator or you also do design work um so are you are you um yeah and and are you working in the front end now? Maybe that's the question I really want to know is, do you work right in the front end of policy or program design now? So the, the answer to this is yes, no, or don't know. 
<laughs> you don't know, you're not sure or unsure. So yes, no. So, so the question is, do you currently work in the front end of design, um, programming, um, human-centered design, co-design? So the so go for it. You can press yes, no, maybe. Let's see. Let's see what we've got. So just the sense of who we are. Yes, no, yes, no. Oh, yeah, I think the yeses. No, maybe I would say, I don't know. I'm doing a very quick quantitative analysis here. What do you reckon? I think the yeses might just have it, but it's fairly even, would you say? 50-50, I would say, 50 /50. roughly, right. roughly. Yeah, if anybody can add up, they can, they can, maybe, a few maybes. Okay, excellent. It just helps me know who we've got here today. So it's lovely to know where you're all from and that there's quite a few people who are work, working in the early spaces. I think it's been um, on the increase. So evaluators are being asked to come in. I don't know about you, but I first started to work at the front end, probably just because I was doing a lot of theory of change and program logic work. And I'd often get asked in as part of an evaluation, maybe after something had been running for quite a while and they ask you to come and do an evaluation. And I used to say, well, I just need to clarify what you're trying to do first, like clarify the theory of change, clarify the program logic. And then they'd go, oh God, why didn't you do this at the beginning? Like, this is terrible that we're doing it now because we realized that we, you know, things didn't make sense at the beginning. And so gradually I got invited in more and more to the beginning rather than at the end. And I guess that's fairly normal. But over the 30 years that, 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 you know, wasn't normal. I remember back 30 years ago, people really thought that evaluation was only, you bought the evaluators in when the program was over, you know, over. So now things are changing in, in that regard now. And certainly we do evaluation planning much earlier, but also, so I get invited in before there's even a program, before what really at the very earliest concept. And that's what I wanted to chat with you today with this case study. So on that note, I might start to share my slides. So just one second and bear with me. Yeah, I'm gonna try and be a bit fancy today. I've got a video to share with you. Now hopefully you can see that now uh hmm. yes yes great i can't see you unfortunately let me just see if i can hold that oh well i'll trust that you're with me okay <laughs> so okay can you see it right can you see it correctly now yes yeah, yeah. not in slideshow okay so what i'm going to do we've just done the acknowledgements going to share this case study of it and, and this is the thing that's really surprising and interesting about this is it's a 10 year journey. It's the first time ever, maybe it'll be the only time that I get a 10 year evaluation contract. And the initiative, um, all of the people knew from the beginning that it was gonna be a 10 year thing. It was funded. It was funded by philanthropy, which is often where you get these longer, longer horizons. And I'm gonna tell you firstly, a little bit about the initiative itself, which is very interesting. It's in um, South Australia, and it's the community led social innovation context. So I'll tell you a little bit about how it began and then we can um, get your questions and so forth. But I guess I'm really interested. This is my question for you. Maybe you can think about this as I'm presenting is how does this differ or is it similar to what you do in your evaluation practice? And I guess what does what does it mean for evaluation practice for evaluators to be working in the sort of space? And that's the question I'm going to come back to at the end of this presentation. Okay, so the name of the initiative is Our Town, and I often think it's best um, described by the people themselves. So I'm going to try and do something quite fancy now, if I can do it, which is to play a video. So let's see. I just need to make sure I have the right settings to be able to share. Um, one second, advanced sharing, hopefully. Now, can you hear that? Not yet, Jess. Not yet. I've just got to get the advanced, the, um, just one second, advanced sharing. I'm really trying to be fancy today. <laughs> Where's it get popped up last time? It said optimize for sound. Let me just. 
Let me just try once more and I'll give up if not. Can you hear that? Not yet. I think it's frozen. There's a, a square in the middle of the screen. It could be it's. Okay, let me just um, stop sharing and start again. I'm yeah. really going to give it one crack and then we can, <laughs> uh, we can give up. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right. <laughs> This is what happens when you try and be fancy, hey? Right. So share from there. So you should see the screen. Yeah. Now. Link. Never managed to stop this working before. Mm. Not coming up with the advanced. It worked before, didn't it? It worked fine before, yeah. Could mm -hmm. be a bandwidth issue as well. Oh, well. Okay, I'm going to give up. It's all There's right. I'll tell you about it. There's a it comment was... in the chat. Yeah. Maybe open the video in your browser and share that. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. But... I think that I'm going to give up. <laughs> it's okay i'm all ready it was just a really nice little video i'm going to yeah. tell you about the initiative so um the initiative is in um it's focused in south australia it's in uh it's a community-led initiative focused on mental health and it is a partnership so this is important to get a foundation wanted to do things differently and they provided the funding and it's a small foundation actually and they put all their call put all their funding into this one initiative and uh, so when when I first I got involved right at the beginning when the when the foundation first decided that they wanted to do this work uh, before before they put tenders out before they'd got anybody on board before there were any towns so that's how early uh, I was invited in as an evaluator so let me just share I'm not, sh not trying to share the screen just my slides now <laughs> can you see oh let's let's, let's share. Can you see the screen okay? Perfect, yeah. Yeah. So um, it started off with, as often does, uh, some research around health needs. The health people will be glad to see that this happened, <laughs> about health needs and priority in South Australia. And um, they looked at what was going on and there was some serious, serious issues, particularly around mental health and well-being. And so, um, this initiative was 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 developed with this idea that it would be community ed led and owned of course it didn't start like that because there were no communities on board and i'll come to that later but it was this long-term 10 years of funding and it was going to be social innovation and evaluation together all the way through with a focus on prevention and promotion so um while it was it, about um, mental health and promotion it was very much going to be led by the towns so uh so it, and it became in suppose more about well-being as time went on so in terms of who was involved i'll explain these acronyms so the community teams there uh, eventually when uh, expressions of interest went and out and there was a process to apply six towns ended up getting involved and the initiative's three years in now and the towns of sejuna cummins berry kimber mid murray and kangaroo island there's also an advisory group of the FAFF, the FFF is Faith Fuller Foundation, that's the um, foundation, the South Australian government are involved, um, there's, community, there's community members, people with lived experience on the advisory committee, as well as people from the, the, uh, the organisation that is supporting the implementation, which is TAXI. TAXI stands for the Centre for Social Innovation. So the support team, we call them the support team, is a, is a combination of a full foundation, Clear Horizon, the evaluators, and Taxi, who are the social innovators. And there is also a, a network of all the towns, which increasingly plays a role. The model of our town, I guess, is you've got distributed governance. It's got a lot of capability building, participatory decision making, very strong focus on network, networked communities. And it does aim to have policy and systems influence beyond these towns. It is based on four key principles. The principles were really important, actually. We started off with a few more, but we ended up 
co-develop these principles with the communities, and there was only four of them, community led and owned, leading our way through change, seeing and acting on the bigger picture, and modeling men mentally healthy practice. So where we are now, with, we're about into year three, um, the towns are on board, they're, they're beginning, they're employed, they have employees uh, in the towns, they are running the initiative themselves, uh, they are um, networking together and they are, we have been building their capability to do their own evaluation. So that's where we have now and it's very much um, a networked approach and the network is that sort of something that's being really worked on now so that there's a network, for example, of, of champions, evaluation champions from each town who come together and share their practice. And there's other types of networks as well across the whole initiative. But I guess I'm here today really to talk about the evaluation, not the initiative. So let me focus on that. So um, we often say that the, um, I like to say it was slow cooked. One thing that I've really learned about working in social innovation is that you can't go too fast. You can't, there's no point in developing a big evaluation framework. You might as well throw it away um, because there is nothing there yet to develop a framework around. So it started with developmental evaluation in, in, in the very pure sense of the term because it was, I started right off with the, with the um, foundation when they were first thinking of the concept and we started to think about what were the outcomes, what were the principles that might hold this, this initiative firm. And then uh, we moved into contracting phase where the, um, the evaluator and the social innovators were brought on board, but there were still no towns at this point. Um, so we worked in the first year or so, it was you know, really trying to work out what the initiative would be, how we would bring towns on board, how would we would ensure that it would be community led, what sort of selection process could we use, how could we involve people with lived experience, and eventually what were the outcomes. So the role um, right back in those early phases of the evaluator was sort of very much um, uh, helping to develop the early stages of the initiative. But also um, I played a critical friend role. Um, and once we'd set up the, once we'd agreed on those set, the principles, we very much used the principles to check in on ourselves, check that we were following them because it was all pretty wild. And so the principles sort of anchored us in action and to capture learnings. So I did, we did um, process evaluations about every six months to capture how things were going and to get feedback and to feed it back to the initiative. So this was the early dead stages. And sometimes I like to think of the roles at this stage of the developmental evaluator. And so I played this critical friend role. So this is very much like um, uh, challenging people like, oh, I'm watching, seeing a pattern that we, um, we, we said we wouldn't do. We seem to be falling back into that trap again and helping people um, stay anchored, particular in the principles. Also facilitating pieces such as the theory of change development and the principles. I, I call it the scientist. There was definitely an evaluation where I um, role where I began to think about, um, we all began to design the longer term impact evaluation framework and start to think about how we would measure the impact and, and what that would look like in the long term, as well as capturing notes and process of what was happening and what were the key learnings, because it's over a 10 year horizon. I've never done a 10 year horizon before. It's really interesting how you start a 10 year horizon. It was quite, quite illuminating. So um, in the first phase, and I'm gonna talk about two phases really. The first phase was sort of um, uh, from nothing, if you like, through to selecting towns and um, getting them on board, getting them employed. Uh, and then it sort of shifts more into a community led phase, which is phase two. So phase one is sort of before the towns or as the towns were coming on board. So this was um, supporting and defining and helping to, if you like, build what our town was, build the model or codify it. So that was developing the principles and the theory of change and developing what we called an umbrella evaluation strategy. It had to be fairly loose because we didn't yet know what the thing was gonna be. So you couldn't develop a typical evaluation framework we had to hold off, but we could have a bit of a strategy and thinking about what we'd need later on. The second component uh, was um, to helping the actual shortlisting and the selection process. So we worked right alongside the foundation and the design team 
in uh, you know uh, observing and facilitating feedback and uh, thinking about checking in that we were following the principles and how selection was done that we were acting with integrity in the selection process and also they really wanted to select towns not based on the written word not based on the typical uh, reasons you might um, use applications they wanted to let different suspects you know be successful and so there were different ways that the towns were evaluated for growth and capability and potential impact and there was very different ways of selection than i've ever seen before so we were like feeding in and supporting that and doing process evaluations of how it went and getting feedback and like uh, so forth and yeah in the end we also did um we we, we assessed um the capability growth of the towns and that fed into the sex selection process because the idea was were towns were town teams um moving towards a more sort of mature and were they learning and were they building their capability and that that was one of the, the things that were looked at in selection and there were 20 towns that applied originally and there were six towns that eventually uh went through with four of them getting the 10-year funding and that was phase one um and I guess phase two was, um, was this is when phase two is now the phase that we're in now, it's sort of started about two and a half years through. And at this phase, we switched really focus because the towns were now in place. And the whole idea was that they would do their own uh, evaluation work. So it became very much, we stopped doing developmental evaluation and we started building the capability of towns to do their own evaluation. So at Clear Horizon, we have an academy and so we took people through the uh, online learning uh, academy and coached in between things and they built their own theories of change and built their own building their own measurement framework and started to collect data themselves so that's taken uh, it took longer than i in initially anticipated um sort of been taking i guess about a year of a really strong capability building phase with the emergence of some champions and now we're also beginning to think about how we um develop uh, the impact measuring framework for the whole initiative and that's right from policy influence work to actually changes in in um in well-being and mental health but it's very much grounded in the work of the towns and it's sort of drawing from um their own their theories of change so there you go that's phase two in terms of the i thought you might be interested in that overarching evaluation framework so there's sort of four components to it. So there's measuring against the theory of change and there's three levels that we measure at. There's the shared goals that the towns are aiming to achieve, the systemic changes and there's a systems change focus, and there's also the activities and engagement. So three levels of measurement, periodic evaluations, started off with sort of process evaluations and moving into more picking up emergent um, impacts. Um, the developmental evaluation which was very strong at the beginning uh, in capturing learnings and and i guess it's still strong it's just more just more across a bigger group of people now a very strong learning focus and then there is this new part which is capacity building in now because we are not the ones who who do that for the towns anymore is the theory of change that was developed which is fascinating to develop a theory of change over 10 years but you'll see here i won't go into details but you see here that the years eight to ten are goals set by the community for community are realized so they're not even named because it's community-led um, but there's also intentions to influence policy and create this regenerative network of towns who are working on their own mental health and well-being and so this is this sort of flow helped us to focus on where evaluation would look at different phases we have a concept cube that evaluation happens at the town level, but it also happens at the network level. Again, it's three levels, three theories of change, but we also have this learning uh, set of learning questions, triple loop learning that goes alongside it. So that's the sort of summary of the conceptual framework. And these are the levels, again, uh, measuring impact, measuring systems change, and uh, measuring engagement and reach. So this that sort of visualization of it. it, it it's quite hard to conceptualize a 10 year evaluation with all these different parts to it. So we tried different ways. Some people really like these concept cubes to describe how different sorts of results would arrive at different times. And that was to manage our expectations of 
when we would see change, but also where, where the evaluation should focus at different times. But always we were looking at what we were learning. We were checking in on our principles, whether we were holding true, so that's the way we were working, if you like appropriateness and beginning to gather uh, impact and measurement and outcomes measurement as things moved forwards. And then progress markers was where we were, where we at the stage we expected to be at. So uh, these are the key evaluation questions. That's three main ones. Uh, what's the overall impact? Uh, what's to what extent is our town shifting systems and conditions for transformation? And what did we do and how well did we do it? The three sort of simple framing questions. So pushing this across time in the first phase, which I talked about was really basically developmental that lasted for about yeah, two years. And then the next phase, which started about two years and it's going through to about three and a half years is basically um, setting up the baseline uh, for the long-term impact measurement, but beginning to see emergent changes. But there's also a shift at this point because uh, we're not sort of holding all the evaluation work that's being done by towns. And the next phase, which um, will sort of probably start in three or four years, is looking at really impact measurement and learning properly. Okay, so I might stop sharing at this time. So I would love um, to talk to you guys now about what you've heard. And um, first of all, maybe take some questions. So I suggest that you might wanna, because there's quite a few of us on the call, uh, you might wanna put your questions, any questions you've got into the chat function. And, um, and then we can, I can, I can go through them. So first of all, have you got any questions before we go into the, what does it mean for evaluation? Let's just, I'll just start by answering any questions about this case study that you might have. So uh, feel free to ask questions and I've got the chat function up. Uh, so anybody, I don't Jess, see any questions. Anybody wanna verbally ask a question? Go for it. I have a question, Jess. I was wondering how big is the sample size and can you, can you give a um, rough estimation about ages and gender distribution in the, in the sample? Sample size, I mean, what do you mean by sample size? I mean, it's not like, um, do you mean how many part people are involved yeah. in the initiative? Mm, mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So there are six towns, and in there are in each town team there are about uh, up to six, seven people who are employed or working in a voluntary capacity to do that, and then they engage with all the people in their town. So it would be thousands of people thousands. who are engaged thousands. in in uh, but indirectly through the town teams who then engage with their communities. Yeah. But we haven't done broad scale surveys or anything like that. It's just not where we're at yet. We're right at the front end. We're sort of forming this thing. Well, it's like we're building the house, but we're, we're nearly ready to let the guests in, but we haven't quite finished building the house yet. It's just at that stage of moving towards uh, what would what maybe would look like more programming, but it's way before that. So it's evaluators working at building, helping build and shape uh, and set things up. Is, is it's quite different yeah than a typical evaluation yeah so i've got some questions coming through the chat now so um how did you achieve how do you achieve this if the organization does not involve you from the beginning i mean that's typical isn't it how often do you get involved at the beginning this is this is unusual for me um i guess um if you're not involved from the beginning yeah you have to work with what you've got don't you and that's the normal situation but um it's i'm really curious with this example when evaluators get brought in right from the beginning i have to say though this was my this is my uh, successful case i've done a fair bit of uh, developmental evaluation and had some really tricky experiences as well and like i've had to close a couple of contracts because it just wasn't possible to do the developmental evaluation work because the conditions weren't set up to do it so yeah it doesn't always go smoothly how do you get involved as an evaluator in social initiatives so early yeah i mean my i had a partnership with uh this innovation group and i've had it we've got a partnership with them for many years i guess um it started about five six maybe six or seven years ago the partnership and they wanted uh to work find evaluators they could work with because they were doing a number of social innovation initiatives and they um and they want them to evaluate them and their first experience in working with evaluators wasn't very good. Um, the evaluators were insisting on things being stabilised and having um, 
a rigorous evaluation plan, which prevented the innovation occurring, so it failed. So they were trying to find evaluators who could be more flexible and more adaptive and uh, be less rigid. And so uh, they came to, I guess, came to us because um, we've got a history of working in a participatory sort of setting. So I guess that was a good, although we had to, we had to, even, we had to really change the way we worked to working with them. And then we built that partnership. So the partnership was already there. Um, but it's happened over years. We had to learn, we had, as evaluators, we had to learn how to show up differently. So there's some implications for our practice here. Like a lot of the things that I was taught in my early days as an evaluator, like having a strong evaluation plan, you know, um, I had to throw that out the window. Like it was quite terrifying to do evaluation work without an evaluation framework there. I don't know if any of you have done that. But it was almost like you had to be, you know, use your skills, your innate evaluative thinking skills on your feet, as opposed to the planning part that we normally do first. Yeah, because you can't really do that when, when the thing's not built yet. It gets in the way. In fact, the plan does. I learned that the hard way, like rewriting a plan, like, you know, I did one developmental evaluation where I went in thinking I would do an evaluation plan, but it was too early. And then I had to redo the plan, as you might expect, and then redo the plan. And then I redid, I think I redid the plan like eight times and I used all the budget up in just doing the planning. <laughs> Total disaster. So like, I had to learn the hard way how to uh, go, okay, I just got to hold off. That's what I mean by slow cooking. Just hold off. Don't like go in too fast. Find out what's going on. Slow the whole process down. Be there to be useful. Serve the social innovator. So the orientation and the positioning of the evaluator is really different. I've got some more questions there, but have a look at them. Okay. Um, uh, where the gender diversity consideration analysis, the support teams seem to be mostly women. Oh no, there, there, are, um, there are men in the support team. Um, in fact, there's a, a guy, um, there's one of one of the men, the evaluators, there's three of us, one is a, one male and there's, a, there's men on the support team as well. I think that was just the photos you showed. Um, remember that the towns are all diverse as well. And so they've, uh, each town team has thought about diversity and who needs to be on the team and they're all very different. Um, but I guess this is more design and it will be the social innovators and the, and the town teams who have those discussions. Um, how do you specifically measure the impact of the collaboration on lifting systems learning and policy advocacy? Yeah, that's a great question. And like, um, we have methodology in place to do that. Um, we sort of, uh, I guess we're using a combination of um, uh, tracking uh, changes in the policy and then uh, finding out what's happened and then using contribution analysis which is um, the way we often work. We use contribution analysis to find out well, what happened and what role did different people play and can you plausibly um, link that back. But we haven't done too much of that yet. Although there have been policy ripples and we need to get onto it. But we do have an impact log to track changes that we see. We sort of use eyes and ears methods. So everybody got an impact log to see what's happening and then we follow it up with like finding out is there something in this. So it's sort of inductive if you like. You have to find out where the ripples are and track them down and see if they relate back to you or not that's the case maybe that's how we usually go about tracking policy change um let's see what would be a key learning or a key success for you to embed capability building within the mail framework key learnings yeah i mean like i guess i i have done like i do lots of training in evaluation i've done that all my life really I'm, I'm a trainer so i uh figured i'd just keep doing it like we'd always done it <laughs> but i was i wrong so i guess the people that we've been training in this initiative they like you know they're not um they they haven't ever done evaluation before they may you know not have um done uh programming before so they've come from all walks of life like you know you've got a mechanic and a hairdresser and a counsellor and they're people from the local communities they're not service providers this is something they might be accidentally you know it might be what their job is in the daytime but they are there not for that reason they are there that most people involved have lived experience of mental health in from a family member or themselves in some form or other 
and so it was so some of the people were like haven't been to university i guess and so i it really it got us to slow down but it worked it still worked the mail capacity building and the approach still worked but we we, we, we ended up just slowing it down and coaching into it so we slowed down we did one piece at a time and then everybody did it and then we brought everybody back together and we shared it and we discussed it and we moved on so we sort of slowed what would normally be we would normally do through the academy a 12-week course three hours a week um in clear horizon academy and learning how to do well we just slowed it right down and did it across the year but built it as we went and that worked quite well but i guess the key learning was that you have to go slowly and you've got to use it it's got to be practical you've got to actually apply it straight away and have chance to share and the sharing between the towns worked really really well they loved seeing each other's work and that's big that's what we want we want the relationships between between them so that they'll go on after we do um how have you navigated and negotiated with the client as your role as an evaluator rather than if you've been contracted in a different role it's interesting because it doesn't feel like the normal client uh evaluator relationship we don't call them the client like we they see themselves that the foundation uh provide the funding and they see themselves as a partner and we see ourselves the evaluators as a partner and the social innovators are a partner and the towns are a partner and everybody's actively involved and i guess everybody's playing roles slightly differently than what they uh, would be used to so um it's a whole different ball game this is why i'm so fascinated by this case study it just feels like it's starting really differently yeah um, so navigating in terms of evaluation, but it is shifting though, and there's been transitions. Like at the beginning, we were sort of like all chatting together, the support team about the findings and interpreting the recommendations of what we'd do differently from each evaluation round. But now uh, that the towns are all there, we've had to rethink our role as evaluators and try, we're actually stepping into a slightly more independent role. Like we, um, we talk to everybody and do some surveys of everybody and everybody comments on everybody and we pull it back and produce a, a sort of report for everybody and everybody then develops their own uh, what we call um, intentions so each group develops their own intentions for how to respond to the findings so we we sort of pulled back a tiny bit we can do that now because there's so many different actors and we sort of need to represent all of them yeah it's sort of interesting the movements of the evaluator through this time span um how do you ensure the mindset of the community is willing to engage with research and evaluation? I have been, it's funny because th these guys are really um, committed to addressing mental health in their community. So um, there's no question of commitment and engagement around research on, and data. Uh, I've never even really thought about that. Um, people, it's not about me trying to ensure that they're engage with it it's it's more um the challenge is more about how to build capacity in a way that's not overwhelming and um how to step things out and do things at the right pace we have to keep having to slow down and uh, when you've got 10 years you can go slowly but somehow there's something wrong with us that we keep pushing too fast um and then we have to take a few steps back and slow ourselves down given the flexibility in the evaluation approach how do you balance and manage the risk of not capturing the baseline that you'll need for the evaluation? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm fairly relaxed about the baseline, to be honest, because at the end of the day, we'll probably be using some form of some form of public data, and that data exists already. Um, so I'm not in a hurry to decide um, what measures to use, because they have to be decided by the towns. And there's a whole issue in Australia about data sovereignty and we take that really serious we've got Aboriginal towns First Nations towns and they want a say in how their towns are being described they want a say in what sort of data will be used and they want to hold that data so I, we cannot rush in to deciding what the baseline will be because we have to wait for the towns to be ready to determine what it is they're doing and then develop the baseline so the baseline will be will be sort of like decided about three years into the ten but we can go back, we can go retrospectively and look at data from earlier, um, public data at least. Um, but if it's collected data, then yeah. Um, I, I, funnily enough, I just don't think that's the most important thing. It used, I used to think it was, but I think making sure that data sovereignty and that the right data is collected and that and the evaluation doesn't prevent this great work occurring. You know, something that I've learned 
over the last five to ten years is that evaluation itself can be the problem, can be one of the big problems. It can be colonial. It can get in the way. It can prevent this good work. And that we have to really think about how we show up in these spaces. Just, you know, systems change, work and transformation is all about thinking about how you show up and we're not immune to it. We have to think about how we show up. Um, love contribution and analysis and impact love somebody would like to hear more about that uh actually if anybody's interested in any of the methods that i talk about i don't think there'll be time to go through things like contribution analysis but clear horizon you know i am the founder of a company called clear horizon and we're evaluation specialists but we have we also uh, teach and run a whole lot of things um through our academy and there's also what's called a community, which is a, a free um, space for evaluators to come together and ask questions. And there's a whole lot of resources on there. And you're welcome. It's no cost if anybody wants to go to the um, to the community page, the Clear Horizon community page. There is a whole lot of resources on contribution analysis and impact logs and things like that. And if it's, you can't find it, just ask because uh, that's what people do. They just go there. How do I do this? How do I do that? So that's uh, an emerging. We've got about 350 people. It's fairly active. It's fairly new. It's about a year old. Um, was the 10 year theory of change created in partnership with the towns? Could you talk through how this theory of change came about with such a long term project and so many stakeholders? Yeah, we didn't start with the theory of change. We started with a set of principles and they were co-developed. Well, we start before the towns were there, we had six. And then when the towns came on board, we redid them with the towns. So the, so the principles were developed with towns. So that began with the set of principles. The theory of change, there were some rumblings in the background and we did a bit before the towns came on board. And then, um, and we kept moving that forward and we shared it with the towns. But what happened next is that the towns have all got their own theories of change because they've got their own plans and their own goals so um that box in the theory of change just sort of says towns achieve their goals are set in so i guess there's theories of change at different levels there's an overarching theory of change that describes the whole initiative and how the towns are situated in that but it's also got our policy change supposed to happen and how long-term systems shifts occur so there was some feed, there was definitely lots of feedback from the towns, but I guess it was, it, that started to be assembled before, before the towns came on board, but they fed back on it. But meanwhile, they've been developing their own and then we're shifting the theory of change to come into alignment with what they've done. So essentially, yes, the towns have influenced it, but not straight away because they weren't on board straight away. Yeah, although there were people, there were community members on the advisory committee um not not to the same extent that the towns are, are now um okay uh do, does involving community work smoothly as it is explained or are they latent conflicts and disagreements how do you work with that i mean there this is life there are always disagreements and conflicts and it's a wiggly woggly mass of all sorts of things happening at once um but I do believe like when you set things up well from the beginning, things go much more smoothly. And this is the smoothest I've ever seen it. And I think one of the secrets, and I don't know how, how politically um, comfortable this is gonna be for some of you, is that government weren't involved at the beginning. <laughs> um, there, was no, uh, there was no government involvement in selection of the town. So there was no, uh, we're in an election tomorrow in Australia. There was no uh, ministerial announcements about which towns would get funding or not. There were no towns involved who didn't want to be involved. They had to compete to get the funding. And that was all done. Um, it was all done without government involvement. And government do sit on the advisory committee now, but they weren't there at the beginning. And uh, that has made so much difference. Um, so, I mean, I, I think government's got a really important seat at the table of anything, but it sort of helps if they're not there at the beginning. <laughs> And same with academia, actually. I mean, like, it's a really important role for research and academics, but it was sort of great just to work with really solid um, social innovation and community, people with community development experience at the beginning, just to set things up, to set the culture, to set the ways of working in a way that, because we want it needed to be mentally safe. You, need to, you know, this is people with lived experience. It needed to be a safe space. 
Um, so the, 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 it was sacred, it was really important that we create this atmosphere where people could speak and so forth. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yes, the slides I have um, and the videos are linked on the slides and you can follow on all the links are available for you. I've made a PDF and given it to Maria and um, I'm sure Bill will make them available after this. So you can have them. No pulp barreling, no. <laughs> it's so weird talking about this on the eve of election. I'm feeling a bit nervous over here and I don't know how many Aussies we've got uh, in the forum today, but it's uh, been quite tense, this election. Um, so, what, so let's move to the next part of this. I'd love to get you to think about what this means for evaluation. What if we did more work like this? What would it mean for your practice and so forth? So I actually had two questions, didn't I? I better go back to them. So uh, my first questions were, are you seeing work like this? Are you doing work like this? So is this similar to what you're doing or is it really different to what you're doing? So let's do a slam chat. So if you don't mind writing in to the chat function and we'll press button together like we did before. So are you doing what, is this similar to what you're doing? Is it really different? So are you, are you doing, are you in finding the same sort of uh, being invited into the front end like this? So let's find out if this is, if we're having similar experiences. Okay, I'm hoping that you're all typing now. Typing, typing, typing. Okay, let's press go. Yeah, very different, really different on a much smaller scale, yeah. It's exciting, isn't it? And I know it's a real privilege. I know this isn't normal. I feel really, really privileged to have this opportunity, but I feel like I hope that we can all learn from it as evaluators. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like, the, it's like a vision of the future of what could be, isn't it? <laughs> um we never work without some kind of plan yeah i really really that's thank you for being so honest about that um yeah thought of so the general consensus is um uh that no people aren't doing a lot of this um i'm i mean like my team i have a team clear horizons are a medium-sized company so we have about 50 employees and we're evaluation company so we're actually I think we're the biggest evaluation, like a dedicated evaluation group in, in this region. And uh, I work, uh, my team's about 12, no, 16 people, and we are working the social policy space, like you guys mostly. And uh, we're mostly doing developmental evaluation now. So I think it is on the rise, but nothing quite so, so pure, if you like, as this. But it does get me excited about the roles of evaluators into the future um, and how forming partnerships with social innovators and they love having us on board. I think the nice thing about it is that it's, um, they love having us um, and we love working with them. And I'll tell you why I love social innovators. They love feedback. They don't get defensive. They're like, oh, fantastic. You've got some negative findings. How good is that? Let me have a look. And they smile when I give them negative findings, I mean, if only. So there's a lovely, there's a lovely possibility of a relationship between um, social innovators and evaluators because we sort of need each other and you can go places. I don't think you can go alone. Um, evaluation can de-risk this sort of social innovation, social innovation work. And this type of really cutting ed edge social innovation work, I believe has potential to really address wicked societal problems. And we've got plenty of them, haven't we? So if we can learn to work in with this stuff, we can actually work really constructively to make a difference. And that gets me excited. It gets me so excited that we can actually make a difference. So I think the world needs it right now, hey? Yeah. Okay. So um, any final comments? And, um, you know, we are at 10.2. So we won't be going much longer. So I invite you to turn your cameras on and like have a bit of a chat about any implications for evaluation. If we were to do more of this sort of work, what would be the implications for us? Has anybody got anything they'd like to say? Uh, what do you reckon? What if you guys all got to do this sort of work? What would it mean? <laughs> what would it mean if this became more normal or more widespread? What would we have to shift? Yeah. Catherine, I, yeah. um, I, I think the biggest thing from my experience is just um, 
the cost implications that the the twists and turns the exploration the time that you need to spend actually collaborating with whoever the partners are um, has massive implications sort of because at the same time I think it puts you in a phenomenal position to do a much better job yeah. because of that semi-embeddedness and um, I just wanted to I guess echo your point that people who are doing innovation it's it's are so receptive to this work yeah. and it's actually um it's the kind like working with social enterprises and things like that it's just as you said such a privilege because yeah. you get to work with people who are so engaged in what they're doing so driven often really charismatic interesting people and it's just such an energizing space to be in compared to government work yeah for example and it um and i love though, it catherine it is you're right and i like i think about this a lot like it's you know and it's also a different sort of contracting it's taking yeah. me a while i'm a bit of a businesswoman you know and um because of uh, being the founder of clear horizon i think about contracts and business and how how it works and the contracts have to be different mm. you know uh, it's not really a milestone based if i can't go oh we'll pay this much for the plan and then this much for the interviews and this much for the report because you're actually being paid basically for a service yeah so it's like uh, like a service like it's more like an hourly daily rate you know how many hours how many days is it and then how do you manage that and you can actually bring your rates down the rates can come down a bit because you can get paid hour for hour which doesn't happen does it normally when you do an evaluation you say oh that'll take me 10 hours and really it takes you 20. so it's sort of like um you can be more you can be more real about how long it takes and you can and be more flexible in hour. a way yeah and it's more livable yeah and that's exactly i mean i only have myself to be dealing with like i am an independent yeah. consultant and so that flexibility is a big part of what i'm able to offer yeah. i guess yeah. and uh very much things are done on well this is how many hours mm. we're calculating mm. these different activities will take and any and just yeah exactly what you said basically yeah but um, i mean how do we show that this work is really worth it because what I see is when you work like this, you get amazing outcomes. And to be honest, as an evaluator, like you would have seen, how many evaluations have you done where there weren't good outcomes at the end? Like there just wasn't. I mean, like I, I've evaluated, you know, I've overseen many evaluations and mostly they're disappointing. And when you work like this, you can start to see the power of what change can achieve if you do it properly. And you're like, oh my God, all that money wasted and things that didn't work. Why not fund this instead? Because it actually seems you know to be promising it's early mm. days but i'd love to see what this can this this does in 10 years watch this space yeah it seems to be uh and and yet it all adds up to about 10 million dollars not not for the evaluator it's the whole initiative that sounds like a lot of money but seen a lot more money wasted than that yeah. <laughs> things that weren't successful yeah well we're nearly we're running out of time is there anybody else who'd like to comment about the implications for what this might mean or your practice, yes, Lillian. I think um, that it actually gives um, the results of the evaluation a lot more credibility because people are actually invested in it. And so they, um, I think that it's when you have that early buy-in that, you know, people, they, because I think that there's um, an underlying fear of what the evaluation results will be. When it's unknown, when you're sort of like working with groups and that um, have not been involved with evaluator and then they just sort of think, oh, my gosh, I wonder how all this is going to go. Whereas I think you get that confidence built in at the very, very beginning and you sort of, because you're travelling along with the mm -hmm. evaluators and I think that that's really important because it gives the whole project so much um you know pe people have real faith because they've had sort of um they've, they've been able to put in their you know um put in their perspectives and and be heard at the same time so i think that's really important yeah there's very strong trusting relationships between the evaluators in fact the community really they really respond well to the evaluators and sometimes we've got to watch that because sometimes they like to have a little you know word in our ear like oh I can we can give feedback to you about anything we want so you've got to be careful sometimes but there is this there is certainly not this feeling that the evaluators are the 
you know, outsiders who've just come in to like extract and and test us. There's none of that. It's um, I think we're very de definitely on the inner and known well and have relationships and get invited to people's houses and and they'll know us. I mean, uh, so it's really um, it's really a different world. It's it feels so mentally healthy as well. I don't, and I, because this, I mean, that's one of the intentions of the initiative is to always model, model uh, mentally healthy practice. But I mean, like, what does modeling mentally healthy practice in evaluation look like? You know, isn't that an interesting concept? Yeah. Okie dokie. Any more questions? And we might wrap it up soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, we might call it a day, hey? I hope you all have a beautiful day and that this was interesting for you. Yeah.